Landrieu went on to graduate from Vanderbilt Law School and then took a position as Assistant Attorney General for the state of Alabama. After a few years, he discovered what being a lawyer was all about when he went to work for a big city law firm in St. Louis, Missouri. And then after a few years, he got relief and went to be Assistant Attorney General for the state of Tennessee for about seven years, I believe. And then, well, while he was there, he, his uh, position was to answer the lawsuits and complaints of convicts who were in jail. He said his job was to keep convicted criminals in jail. As such, he argued many times before the Sixth uh, Circuit of Appeals, which is one step below the Supreme Court in Cincinnati and other places as well. And then a couple of years ago, he left Nashville, go to California to become an attorney for the federal prisons in the western United States. Interesting to note that when he was in high school, he was a page for Senator Jeff Sessions. Now it looks like in about a week, Jeff Sessions is going to be his boss again. <laughs> I hope you didn't leave any bad memories. <laughs> but Andrew's a brilliant young attorney, had the world ahead of him, and he was making great strides with a bright future. And then, and then, well, I'm going to let him tell you about the then. Andrew, come. Share with us from your heart, and let God bless us through your words. Thank you for letting me be here today. It's working all right? All right, so in case anybody's concerned that there's an attorney up here speaking to you, I have two consolations to offer that I hope will help. First of all, I'm not preaching. I'm here to tell you my story, and uh, my last few months of my life, and what I've learned from it, and what God has taught me. And secondly, if we're still you know, having some fears there, as an attorney, I've looked through the church's insurance policy, and we are covered if God sends a bolt of lightning to strike us down. <laughs> but we'll be okay. So there, there's no need to fear. But, you know, fear is something that I've thought a lot about lately. You know the most commonly repeated verse in the Bible? It's or most commonly repeated commandment. It's some version of the phrase, do not fear. It's almost as if God knew this might be an issue for some of us. I can tell you it has been for me. It all started in late October. I was at work one day when suddenly my left eye started to go out. I was having a very blurry vision that got worse throughout the day. So I went to the eye doctor and uh, said, hey, what's going on? And at the time he told me, oh, well, it's, you just got some fluid behind your eye. Uh, it'll resolve on its own. It'll take about a month. It was right before Halloween, so I got to you know, wear the patch and be a pirate, and nobody knew the difference. Uh, it was all, all going reasonably well. Uh, but he did tell me, well, you should probably see a specialist just to sort of monitor your progress. So I went into the specialist appointment, honestly kind of annoyed that I even had to go, because I was low on leave time at work. It was taking away from my ability to get things done. I had some deadlines, and you know, I have to pay for the specialist visit, and... I knew that I would have to have my eyes dilated, so my wife had to take off work. It was just kind of a life inconvenience, and I showed up ready to tell the specialist that they really ought to have some cure for people with fluid behind their eye, and they could get better overnight without having to wait through a month. But, you know, the, the visit wasn't exactly what I expected. I went, and the doctor examined me and said, there's actually nothing wrong with your eye. So if you can't see... It's something between your brain and your eye. Something in your brain canal. And there are two likely alternatives. It's either a brain tumor or multiple sclerosis. So the doctor had me go for an emergency MRI uh, right down the hallway. And, you know, they had this moment of thinking, well, that, that's crazy. I ran a half marathon a few weeks ago. It can't be multiple sclerosis. I'm doing fine. And a brain tumor, I haven't had any symptoms. And, you know, how do I even know to trust this doctor rather than the first one? We said it was just fluid, but hesitantly, I decided I'll do the MRI and get it over with, and I did that, and after a, a series of tests that followed, uh, you know, I didn't have a brain tumor. Uh, I did have multiple sclerosis. So on November 10th, I was uh, diagnosed, and I didn't know a lot about multiple sclerosis. I had a vision in my head of you know, a wheelchair-bound patient whose muscles had atrophied and were unable to take care of themselves. Uh, I had that picture in my head, and I began to, to fear. I researched it, and I began to fear a little more. I read about some of the 
things that go along with the disease. So it's the progressive nerve disease where your body begins to attack your own nerves. As a result, in this patient, they tend to lose function in their arms and their legs. Uh, they tend to have brain mass deteriorate, and uh, over the course of time, it can leave people paralyzed, it can leave people uh, constantly rotating between extreme sweats and killing cold, constant fatigue, and for some people, it can uh, eventually end up interrupting their bladder function and their bowel function. You don't have to worry today that the bubble's down here. I have not progressed to that point yet. Uh, all is good. But nonetheless, as I read about the symptoms, I began to fear. I began to think about life with MS. What if I'm, what if I'm paralyzed? What if I soon can't walk? What if I become a burden to the people around me? What if I can't earn a living anymore? How will I continue to pay my bills? As I began to think through it, you know, your mind wanders towards the worst case. I began to process and, and talk to God a lot about what was going on. And I'm not one of those people who often, every time I pray, feels like I hear God speak back to me. But this one time I did. I felt, as I was, was going through, asking God, among other things, uh, what was to come next? I just I prayed one thing. I prayed, okay, if I have to have this, God, don't waste it. Use me somehow to make a difference in life. In somebody's world, use this disease to impact somebody in a positive way. And I felt like God answered back very quickly. Well, that's up to you. And it struck me. <laughs> Maybe I don't have to fear. You know why? Because had you asked me two years ago, what's your biggest fear in life? It wouldn't have been that someday I wouldn't be able to walk, that someday I would have trouble using my left leg, or that I would sweat through my sheets every night. It wouldn't even be that I would someday not be able to control my bladder function, although I still really hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> it would be that at the end of my life, I wouldn't have made a difference. My biggest fear would have been that when I got to heaven, God wouldn't say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because I had not used my life in a positive way. And I felt like God told me, you have the power to make sure that doesn't happen now. Amen. It struck me then that, you know, I don't have to fear. Because anything that I, I could be afraid of were not the things that really matter. The things that, that really matter were still in my control. The other thing that, you know, Parkinson's disease is a somewhat similar disease, and Michael J. Fox, who has it, called it the disease, the, the, the gift that keeps on taking. Because although it's taken his physical ability, he's learned so much about life through it. One thing I noticed very quickly was how much I had taken for granted. One day in mid-November, as I was suffering through some of the worst of my initial symptoms, I just sat in my backyard, and a gentle breeze came through, a nice sunny 70 degree California day, and I looked out at my orange tree, and I just had this burst of gratitude of what a beautiful day it was. And I thought, wow, two months ago, this same day could have happened, and I totally would have missed it. I thought about all the other things in life I was still excited about. There was a new book on Alexander Hamilton I was going to start tomorrow. There was the Alabama-Auburn game coming up that weekend. I was excited to, to watch. And I thought about a friend who was coming to visit and all these other good things in life so that even when things looked really bad, even when life seemed dark and horrible in a lot of ways, there's still a whole lot of beauty underneath all of it. We just have to look to see it. And sometimes it's so easy to miss that. Today I don't miss it as often anymore. I'm more likely to be in the moment to notice the beautiful day. I have good days and bad. On the good days, I appreciate them a whole lot more. So I began to feel this peace. I even wrote out a little testimony about you know, what, what this has taught me, where it's taken me. And you know, I, I thought I had it all sort of figured out. But I, as I finished writing my testimony, I soon learned very much, very soon thereafter, that we don't actually write our own stories. See, I had one more twist in the, work, in the road that I wasn't expecting. In order to confirm my diagnosis and get insurance to pay for my medications, I had to have what's called a spinal tap. If you're not familiar with the spinal tap, 
Uh, that's probably a good thing, because you don't really want to be. <laughs> Spinal tap is a procedure where the doctor sticks a needle and punctures the protective sac of fluid that's around your spinal column. And to do so, they drain some fluid and test the fluid to see if it has anything that shouldn't be there. There was still, there was still a small chance at the time that I could have either lupus or Lyme disease, and they just wanted to eliminate any other small possibility of that. Uh, after my six days of bed rest that followed, when I came to get my results, uh, it did confirm multiple sclerosis. But the weird thing is, there, there are two kinds of multiple sclerosis. Doctors had been proceeding under the idea that I had what's called remitting relapsing multiple sclerosis. And it's by far the most common, with RRMS, as they call it. A person will have an initial attack of symptoms. For me, it was a loss of vision, uh, constant fatigue, uh, night sweats and constant chills, and you have those symptoms for a while, maybe a couple of weeks, sometimes a bit more first, then they go away and you go back to what seemed like almost normal you were before. It leaves a little bit of an imprint with each phase, with each attack, but you may go months between attacks, sometimes even more. So it's a, it's a progressive march, but it's a slow one and it's interrupted, and that's what most people have and that's what my uh, initial prognosis was. But when my lab results came back from my final tap, it actually looked more like something called primary progressive MS. With primary progressive MS that only about 10% of MS sufferers have, it's just a constant slow decline. There's no remission, there's no break from it. You have an initial bout of symptoms and it just progressively gets worse over time. And what's more, while there are disease-altering drugs for RRMS, there's nothing that's on the market that helps with primary progressive. Well, there's no cure either way, and there's no way to reverse the nerve damage that's done. But at least with remitting relapsing, there are medications that slow the course of the disease. There's research underway on primary progressive medications. There's nothing on the market currently. But the doctors still aren't sure, even as we speak today, but some of the markers looked a little more like the other kind. So I had a whole new bout fear. I was prepared for the idea that over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, I'm going to have some really hard times, but I'll kind of rebound and get on my feet again. I wasn't prepared for the idea that in two years I can be unable to use my arms or legs. It brought on a whole new round of fear. As I dealt with that, as I processed it, the one verse that I constantly came back to was Joshua 1.9. For God says, be strong and take courage. Do not fear, be dismayed. For God will be before you. God will go with you. The thing that struck me about that verse is it doesn't say, just don't fear. It doesn't say, find a way to cope and don't fear. It, actually, it doesn't say, just find a way to be okay with it. It actually says, be strong. It's so much harder. Why did God give us this command? And how do we do it? Well, there has to be a way, or it wouldn't have been part of the command. How do you be strong in the midst of what seems like unspeakable tragedy? Well, I begin to sort of have that conversation. How do I be strong? How do I find enough strength to live the rest of my life with this disease? How do I find the strength to drive 100 miles round trip to work every day when only one eye works? It's terrifying on a busy California freeway? How do I live with a slow, steady decline for the rest of my life? And I had another one of those moments where God told me, I'm not asking you to live with this for the rest of your life. I'm asking you to live with it today. All God asks us is to tackle what's in front of us today. Yeah. And you know, at the end of the day, you can repeat the process tomorrow. And every day, meet back up with God and have the same conversation to ask for enough strength for the day. Well, for 67 days since my diagnosis, God has given me enough strength to get through the day. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, I'm no longer afraid of tomorrow. There are three reasons why. First, and you know, maybe you've got some fear too. Maybe there's something in your life that 
You'd rather not be there. You're not sure how in the long term you're going to deal with. Well, again, you don't have to deal with it in the long term yet. We don't live in the future. Every single moment of our lives are spent in the present, right now. And guess what? You're here. You've made it this far. Whatever you made it through yesterday, you can make it through today. God willing to give you enough strength to make it one day at a time. Secondly, you know, we don't know what the future holds. In two years, I could be in a wheelchair. In two years, I could be in a remission and have not had a single relapse. I don't know. You know, we don't know what's in front of us either. Even if we know what our destination may be down the road, we don't know what the destination is going to look like when you've been there. Has there ever been a restaurant you were really excited about going to and you're anxious to, to get there or a vacation you want to take and you know exactly where you're going, but you don't really know what the experience is until you show up. The restaurant may be better than expected, it may be worse. All you kind of know is you know, what you can see on the internet, but in real life, even the circumstances we envision, we don't know what actually the day-to-day -day process of being in it is going to look like. People keep telling me, I don't know how you have the strength to do this. I say, you know, I'm here, what choice do I have? When you're in a situation, you have so much more strength than you know. Because forward is the only way we can go in life. The third thing that I'd like to remember is that what good does worrying about the future actually do? Anybody have any ideas? Because I haven't come up with any. <laughs> I know that every time I've researched uh, forums or, or blogs with people talking about their MS, you know, the people who write on these things, the worst cases and the people who've had the, the worst set of symptoms. And I've had this paralyzing fear right afterwards every time to think, that could be me someday. What if I'm that person who can't get out of bed? Like, well, you know, there's a million people who don't have that. So, why do I want to ruin my now by worrying about a future that may or may not come? But Jesus said, who can add one foot to their height by worrying about that? For me, he might have said, who can add one foot to your eyesight? Or, who can, add, who can change their type of MS? And by the way, my eyesight has come back about 80%, so I can see most of you. Uh, I couldn't recognize you, but I can see their bodies here. Uh, worrying about the future is kind of like going ahead and paying a bill that isn't due and may not come due. And we only have now. That's where we're living the moment. I'd rather use that time on whatever I'm productive and whatever I'm really passionate about at this moment and spend it worrying about something that may or may not happen in the future. One of the things that I've also found that helps, get over any, any kind of paralyzing fear you may have going on in life or any time when you just feel like the world's kind of broken down around you. There's got to be still something you're passionate about. There's got to be some cause that motivates you, some purpose that you feel deep inside your spirit. If you work towards that, the other things kind of fade away. And you worry less about your circumstances compared to how you can help make the world a better place in whatever field, whatever area, whatever difference you can make in somebody else's life. When you do that, you become a lot less worried about what's going on with you and yourself. Part of my goal in that, I had signed up for a half marathon in that my city runs, the start line's about a half mile from my house. It's a big city festival in the middle of sunny California. It's a really good day to live in my city. I signed up for my half marathon the day after I finished last year's. It's on March 26th, and I remain signed up for it. I really want to do it. I won't be as fast as I've been before. In fact, in mid-December, I went for a run, and I uh, could barely make it through two miles. But I still have this hope of doing it. And I had this, this idea after I'd come back from a vacation. I had resolved that I was going to make it through six miles. My run on December 26th. No matter what came, I was going to do it. When December 26th came, I woke up. I, 
took my first injection of the medicine I'd been prescribed. I stretched, I got ready, and the crazy thing happened. I ran for four and a half miles with no symptoms whatsoever. Finally, I got a little too excited and a little too fast. I suddenly had a, a little bit of pain in my left leg that got worse, but I made it through. And for the almost three weeks now, since December 26th, my symptoms seem to be in remission. It seems to be an answered prayer. We still don't know for sure. But they're, they're positive signs. But here's what I know. I know for a while, when it was unclear what was going on with me, and there was a possibility of Lyme disease or lupus, I prayed that it would be one of those rather than multiple sclerosis, because uh, the, the, prog the uh, prognosis looked a little better. But I know that whatever the future is, the God who has given me strength for the last 67 days, despite the prayer that I had prayed not being granted, that God still promises that even if the worst thing you can imagine actually comes to pass, it's not the end of the story. The book's not closed. The pages aren't done. We're still, we're still somewhere near the middle of our book. There's more to be written. Let God write it. It's not over yet. You know, it's hard for me to put down a book sometimes that I'm, I'm into, even if I don't really like what's going on. Because you don't know what the finish is going to be. And I was just saying the other day about how you know, one specific book I had read, I really hated it right until the end. And then suddenly the, the finish changed everything. You never know if that's going to be our lives. But through good days and bad, I've come to appreciate the good more, as I mentioned earlier. To be so overwhelmingly happy when the good moments come, and just be so thankful. And so conscious of all I've taken for granted along the way. Uh, in the bad days, the days when I really don't feel like getting out of bed or I trudge through work and have to go to sleep the minute I come home. The days where I can't get myself warm and uh, still manage to sweat through the night. And I find myself I'm more dependent on God. And I find that I'm more focused on the things that are most important. The biggest priorities in life become what's absolutely urgent, and the details kind of fade away. And you know, I wouldn't have signed up for this disease, but on balance, it's not so bad to be more thankful on good days, and more focused on the things that really matter, even on the bad ones. It's not a horrible deal. Well, I know I've been speaking about me, with a whole lot of people in the audience. And everybody's got something going on. I don't pretend that my life being shattered is a, is a unique experience. I know there's, there's a million different versions and a million different stories. If our life didn't turn out exactly the way we had hoped it would, or we even felt entitled that it would turn out. But I know maybe if your world has been shattered too, or if you're feeling a little bit afraid, Maybe you're struggling to even pick up the pieces. You don't have to pick them up all today. I've learned that. You just gotta pick up enough to make it through. And if you want some help, I know that there's a God waiting with just enough strength <coughs> to help you get through the day. Thank you. on a journey that God began before he was formed in the womb, like all of us. God told Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before you were formed in the womb and I had a plan for your life. Then he followed it up with a verse in Romans 8, 28 that says, and God causes all things, the bad and the good, to work together for good to those who know him and love him according to his purpose. Andrew, the journey is a Let me remind everybody else, too.
you know how far each of us are, no matter how young or how old we are from eternity? One heartbeat. Life is flying by. I don't know about you, but I wrote 2010 on a check the other day. I didn't, I didn't realize how fast it was going. We were, we're going to have a prayer here in just a moment for Andrew and all those that would like to stick around for just a moment. And actually,